Heavenly Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. Thanking you for another opportunity to come into your house in prayer, praise, and worship. And Father, we ask right now that you would speak to every heart, that you would renew every mind. Father, many of us are dealing with problems and issues in our bodies, from Cyrus to myself to others, and we are not 100% right now, but you are 100% right now. And you say that your grace is sufficient for us because your power is made perfect in our weakness. So Father, we ask that you would get the, the praise, the glory, and the honor when we're healthy, when we're not, all in between. So Father, we just commit our hearts and our minds, our lives to you right now. And we ask that you would speak a word and that you would get the glory, the praise, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we just celebrated Thanksgiving. And Bethesda, I want you to know uh, that my wife and I are thankful to God for you. Uh, for being with us as we uh, celebrated last week on Saturday uh, my three-year anniversary of being co-pastor here. And we just want to, to say thank you again for everyone who uh, worked behind the scenes, worked in front of the scenes, those who gave gifts and encouraging words that we truly appreciate your presence. Uh, and we continue to pray for this church and for you uh, every week. We go before the Lord for you. So thank you for being with us as we celebrate it. So I'm not 100%, as you know, I'm dealing with some stomach issue. I've got an appointment with a specialist on December 3rd, and, uh, but God is good, I'm here. Amen. So uh, you pray for me, as well as you pray for Cyrus. He was having some asthma-related issues, uh, which is why he couldn't be here last week. Uh, but we did hear from Reverend Granby last week. Yes. Uh, he pointed out that Cyrus has the heart and the mind of a worshiper. Yes. And he will worship the Lord no matter who's around. Yes. And so we praise God for that in Cyrus. And we just uh, ask for God to continue to work in your young life. For eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men and women, what good things God has laid up in store for you, Cyrus, and for your family. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, Psalm 46, verse 10. Well, I'll read verses 1 and 10. God is our refuge and strength, and ever present help in trouble. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. For the next few moments, I want us to wrestle with being still. Being still. Say that. Be still. Be still. And know, and know that He is God. That He is God. Amen. Every generation has its struggles. Every generation has its issues. Every generation has its crises, its calamities, 
And God's word is relevant in each and every generation. Even if that generation does not want to receive what God has to say. God's word applies to each generation. His truth is present in each generation. And reading uh, this scripture, this makes us think that it could have been written in our time. Mm. Even though it was written uh, thousands of years ago, but it applies. And that's the wonder of God's word, that even though it was written for a specific people in a specific place at a specific time, yet God is so awesome that his word can apply to every time Amen. and every people in every place in every situation. Amen. And Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. And so as we read through Psalm 46, uh, we see a listing here that reminds us of things going on today. It talks about earthquakes. It talks about mountains crumbling into the sea. You remember the volcano in Hawaii. It talks about oceans roaring and, and foaming and surging. Sounds like a tsunami. It talks about nations being in chaos and kingdoms falling apart and wars raging around the planet. But God. I say, but God. But God. But God desires in the midst of all the struggles to bring peace. But God desires in the midst of all the, the wars to topple evil rulers and bring times of refreshing to those who believe and trust in him. While the chaos rages all around us, God declares, I am a very present help in times of trouble. Yeah. He declares that I am your refuge uh -huh. and your strength. Uh -huh. now, and the NIV it says an ever-present help means that he's, he's everywhere at the same time. There's not a situation that you're not going through that he's not present. He's yeah. ever-present. But when you look in the King James, New King James, it says a very present help uh, in a time of trouble. And, and that very uh, is, is a, uh, a qualifier that, that increases in magnitude. So uh, when something is good, right, God created uh, the, the universe, he created the heavens and the earth, and he said, this is good, this is good, this is good. And then he got to us, uh, humanity, he said, this is very good. You've had uh, some food that you may have liked, and, and, and it tasted good, and then someone handed you some seasoning, and you added a little bit, and you, you hooked it up, and you tried it again, you said, oh, this is very good got some people who, who can sing and, and you say that, oh, that's good, but then you have a Mahalia Jackson or an Aretha Franklin or a, a Jennifer Hudson and you say, oh, this is very good. And so this very, he says that, that God is a very present help in our time of trouble. It doesn't just say that he's a, a present help, that he's a very present help Amen. in our time of trouble. That's his, his promise that he is a very Amen. Present help in our time of trouble. In other words, we are not alone. No matter what we go through, no matter what we face, no matter what struggles, no matter what situations we find, He is a very present help in times of trouble. If you're in a time of trouble, know that somewhere in the midst of that trouble, God is right there with you. Amen. That He's waiting to bring you through. And so we are not a Alone, alone. And so in verse 4, we see uh, that God has a river that flows through a city, that, and, and God dwells there in the city. And not only does God dwell in the city, right, the, the city of, of Jerusalem, but God dwells in us, right? God dwells in his temple, and God says that in Christ, uh, that we, our bodies, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and so he dwells in us. So God has a river that brings uh, provision and peace and prosperity in the midst of a raging world, and the word tells us in John 7, 38, Jesus says that
to those who believe in me, as the scriptures declare, that out of their bellies will flow rivers of living water. God has a river in the city, and God has a river in you. If you belong to him, he's got a river in you. God declares truth. The world declares facts. At some point, facts and truth will collide. And truth will reign supreme for those who <coughs> believe. Verse 10, where God says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. It is about reinforcing verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. It's about reinforcing verse 1 in, the, in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. So in verse 10, God says, be still and know that I am God. So let's look at these words, this, this command that he gives us, be still. There's so much pressure to perform today. Really, in every generation, there's pressure to perform. But there's so much pressure to perform. There's so much pressure to do. There's so much pressure to be busy, to have deadlines. We've got deadlines on top of deadlines. We've got, we've got more stuff on our plate than we have plate. And there's so much pressure to do. But God says, be still. And it seems unnatural for us to take time to sit Still, but this is what God says we are to do when we, when he says be still. Our doing, the work that we do, is the activity of our hands is supposed to flow out of our being. Well. Our doing is supposed to flow out of our being. Amen. But so many of us are busy, we don't have time to be. Mm. <laughs> See, to be is about focusing on the moment. You're not thinking about the future endeavors, the things that you got to do later on today, uh, tomorrow, next week, Christmas is coming, all the next year, New Year's resolutions. No, 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 we're not, we're not focused on that. We're, we're, we're focusing on the moment. We're not thinking about, we're not reliving the past. Our, our, our failures and successes and what happened yesterday, what didn't work out last year, what happened when we were five and how was it like us. No, 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 we're not thinking about that. We're not concerned about that. We are being, we are being focused in the moment because if we are not focused in the moment, we will miss opportunities that God brings our way. Amen. Where you are right now, where I am right now, who you are right now, at 1051, <laughs> who you are, who I am, right now. But you know, some people keep busy in order to avoid yeah. having to stop and look and say, where am I right now? <laughs> who am I right now? Right. Because that interrupts that introspection is like looking in the mirror and some people are, are too insecure sometimes we get too insecure and we don't want to look in the mirror and so what do we do we keep moving we keep doing we keep busy we say no no I don't have time to be I, I don't want to be I just want to keep going I just want to keep doing I want to I want to live for for other people and other things and yet God says no be still still to power down to disconnect from the activity of the world. The world says busy, 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 go, go, go. Microwave society wanted yesterday. Technology overload, we're constantly, uh, and technology, the phone is constantly ringing the text. Uh, this morning I was trying to, to sleep about five o'clock, my phone, uh, the text started going. Because uh, a family text, one of my aunts, it's her birthday, everybody starts chiming in at like five in the morning. <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to get there, but I just want to sleep. <laughs> the phone just keeps going off. <laughs> right, so there's this technology overload, but you know what? Even our electronics reminds us that we can't keep running forever. Yeah. You know what happens to your phone? 
or to your tablet or to your computer, when you keep it going on and on and on, what does it start doing? Glitching. It starts not working right. I remember when I got my first iPad, and uh, but I, I thought I was turning it off, but all I was doing was putting it to sleep. And so one day it started glitching. And I'm like, what is wrong? I had it for almost a year. And I'm like, what is wrong with this thing? And I called my dad, and I said, Dad, the, my iPad is glitching. I don't know what to do. He said, did you turn it off? I said, yeah. He said, how did you turn it off? I said, I pressed the button at the top. He said, did you hold it, or did you just press it? I said, I pressed it, and the screen goes, and it, it's off. He goes, no, that's just putting it to sleep. You gotta press and hold it until you get the, the power thing come up and you slide the thing and then it turns off completely. It, it, it powers down. And when I did that and let it sit for a few minutes and powered it back up, guess what? No glitches. That's a reminder for us that, there, there, that the being still is about powering down. We're constantly moving. We're constantly performing. We're constantly doing. And we need to take time to be still. That's why God made the Sabbath. Amen. It's a time for us to be still. Good, bro. Amen. But we're not just being still just to be still. You see, what happens is when we keep going, then we become reactionary in how we, 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 we act. And so the devil loves it when we are in reactionary mode. We get into the most trouble when we are in reactionary mode, when we react versus instead of responding. They don't call police officers and uh, EMTs and fire, uh, firemen and women, they don't call them first reactors. They call them first responders because they have trained to be able to handle situations and to be calm under pressure and to be able to go in when everybody is running out. And they're able to respond to the situation, to accurately assess the situation, and at least they should be able to do that. So the devil loves it when we are in reaction mode. Because then, if somebody, you push me, I push you. You punch me, I punch you. You cut me off in traffic, I got speed up and cut you off in traffic. You curse me out, I curse you out. Right? All of these things are reactionary. And many people have lost their lives. Many people have had their lives ruined and destroyed because they were busy reacting versus responding. You know, they tell you, you know, with the kids, count to five, count to ten, right? Somebody says, take, take, take a deep breath, right? So be still. In the middle, when somebody's reacting to you, when somebody's doing something that they should not be doing, be still. And know what? That he is God. And so the devil knows that he can get you when he can push your buttons and you react on the cue. Mm. And he says, hey, demons, watch this. <laughs> uh, last year, we had, uh, the last year, the year before last, uh, around Christmas time, uh, Noble, myself, and uh, each and I, we, we went uh, to this resort and did skiing for like the first time. And the instructor, uh, we were coming down this little hill, and the instructor, I, I came down, and then Noble came down, and then it was each and I's turn. <laughs> and uh, the instructor, I guess he, he has such a keen eye, when she was getting ready to start, and she started, he looked at her, and he said, watch, she's going to fall. <laughs> and he, he, I got the video, he said, three, two, one. And she fell. Right when he said one. And she went down just like, hmm. So how in the world, right? He is able to look at a situation and assess posture and all these things. Well, the devil is able to come and look at us and assess our spiritual posture and say, oh, no, they don't have it. They think they don't. And so I can come in here and I can push the buttons and I can get them to react. But if we learn how to be still. And know that God is God, then the devil is not going to be able to push our buttons and cause us to act out of character. Second Peter two nineteen says, uh, "We are slaves to whatever masters us." Being still and knowing that God is God helps us to not be mastered by our anger, 
by our lusts, by our personal agendas, uh, all of those things, but to be mastered by God. Amen. In a world raging with multiple crises, crises, multiple situations, there will always be issues to address. There will always be needs that arise. There will always be causes to champion. Pastor talked about that during the mission offering, that there are so many issues, so many needs. And Jesus says in Matthew 26, 11, uh, you will have the poor with you always, but you won't always have me. Now, he's not saying don't help the poor. What he's saying is that we must prioritize, prioritize our lives, and he is supposed to get top billing for our lives. And so the, the, the issue is that it's possible to get caught up in causes and needs and issues and crises and situations and, and being busy and miss Jesus. Amen. That's part of the problem with the, the social gospel, that for, for many people, uh, the, the social gospel moves from being in relationship with Jesus and acting out of that relationship and saying that Jesus is about justice, so we're about justice, and they, they, they separate Jesus from the action. And so you can be busy doing stuff for God and doing stuff in God's name and never spending time with God. Yeah. And we know from Matthew 7 that uh, when Jesus says, everyone who comes and stands before me on that day of judgment, they say, Lord, Lord, everyone's not going to get in. And people are going to break out their list their resume of stuff that they did for God and in God's name. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. <laughs> Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You were so busy doing stuff for and in my name, but you never took the time to know me and to be in relationship. And so no amount of things that we do for God or in God's name can replace actually spending time, quality time with God. And that means that we have to be still. God doesn't call us to change the world. Some people want to change the world. God does not call us to change the world. What he does call us to do is represent him in the world and to make disciples of those who desire to place their faith in Jesus and to become uh, God's children. So we must take the time to be still long enough to hear from God on how he wants us to respond in any given situation. And so being still is not inactivity, but it's a different kind of activity. So we have be still and then we have and no. Say and no. And no. All right. So we have be still and we have and no. And no, uh, you know, we have so much access to so much information, yet we know so little. All you got to do is watch, like, late night television, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Fallon and, and, and all, all of those people, when they do, they go out on the street and they ask people questions, you know, who's the 44th president? Uh, let me see, is that, you know, right, right? And they go, they just ask them the common, how, how many states? In, in, in the United States, right? What's it? And people don't know, right? It's all, what, what's, who, who, who is this person? Uh, and, and, and we have so much access to information at our fingertips, yet we know less now in many areas than we did before. Before there were cell phones, I had phone numbers memorized. Wow. <laughs> now the only number I know memorize is my own number, my wife's number, and my parents' number. Like everybody else is like, let me, let me press the button. Hopefully it's in the phone. Because <laughs> if, it, if it's not in the phone, I'm in trouble. Right? I used to have my uh, my bank account memorized, the number. But now, you know, now they, they, they did the thing, you know, a few years back, you could just put your card in and you know, press the put your key in and the, the teller will write it in. And so now, I, I don't know. <laughs> right? So we have so much access. But yet we know less than we did before. And so many of us are experts in the world. We are experts in how the world operates. We're experts.
sports and finances and politics and business and entertainment and athleticism and sports and all of those things. We're experts. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to the word, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to knowing how God works, we are novices. Mm. And it's not because we can't know more. It's not because we can't experience more. It's because we don't take the time to be still and know that God is God. It's good. To know means to, to seek, to ask about, to inquire. And so God wants us to know him. He wants us to seek him, to come to him with our questions and concerns, not just uh, to have a theory about him. But he really wants us to know him and to have an intimate relationship with him. Now, many people think that it's impossible. How, how can God, God is, is, is infinite and he's eternal and he's, you know, running the whole universe. And what do you mean you can have a relationship? You can't see him. He's invisible. Or you can't touch him. You can't taste him. How can you have a relationship with him? Well, he made the way possible. If it was just up to us trying to get to him, no, we can't get to him. But he said, you know what? I'm going to reach down and get to you. And so he says in his word that he wants to have a relationship with us. That means that he opens the door for us to know him if we so desire to know him. Matthew 5, 6 says, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. That's what Jesus said. Jesus, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30 and 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that Jesus is our righteousness. So when you look at Matthew 5, 6, and it says that, that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And when you look at the other scriptures in Corinthians, and it says that Jesus is our righteousness. Then when you look at Matthew 5 and 6, you see those who hunger and thirst after Jesus shall be filled because Jesus is our righteousness. And so God wants us to be filled. With Jesus. Amen. He wants us to be in a relationship with his son. Amen. He wants us to know him and to know his will for our lives. Uh, yes, his will for our lives. <laughs> Romans 12 and 2 tells us that we can know the will of God if we will not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Do we take the time to, to, to stop being conformed to the way the world does stuff? Mm. Mm -hmm. And to begin to become transformed by the renewing of our mind. We are to be still for a specific purpose of disconnecting ourselves from the clutter of life so we can put our focus on knowing God. Psalm 27.4 says this, and I'm almost done. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. That should become the desire for all of us to dwell in God's presence, to be able to seek Him and to inquire, to have this intimate relationship with Him, no matter what the world is doing, no matter what is happening in Washington, no matter what is happening in the Middle East, no matter what is happening in South Korea, no matter what is happening in China, no matter what is happening anywhere that we watch the news and it gets us all filled up with fear and anxiety, no matter what is going on, God says, be still and know that I am God. So we have be still and know, let's look at it, that I am God. God is eternal. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. He's all-powerful. He knows everything about everything about everything. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's ever-present. He not only knows, and he, he's not only powerful, but he gets involved in the situations of our lives. So he doesn't just sit and watch and just, just let us do everything that we think we're big enough to do, but he gets involved in our lives. He's so, he's so powerful and he's, he's ever present that nothing gets past him. Amen. You can't fake him out.
before God just like me and you and give an account for their life. Amen. God works all things out according to the counsel of His will. He is truly our refuge and strength a very present help in times of trouble. But here's the problem. Most of us have never really experienced the truth of this scripture. The reality that he is an ever-present help in time of trouble, that he is our refuge and our strength. Most of us have never fully, truly experienced that because we refuse to be still and know that God is God. We live our lives independent of him. Most of the times in our thoughts and our actions and our habits, we can go a, a, a good chunk of the day and not seriously consider Jesus. And just talk about we get up, we're out the door, and we're, we're, we're going to work or school or wherever we're going, and next thing you know, it's 12 o'clock, it's time for lunch. Next thing you know, it's 3 o'clock. Next thing you know, it's 5 o'clock. We're getting on the train, and we get home, and then and right before we crash, Lord, thank you. <laughs> but the whole day is gone by, and so we don't take time to be still and know that God is God, and so we don't get the results that he says that he wants to give us. Right. That he is our strength. Yes. And our refuge. Yes, he is. Amen. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes. Amen. So when you feel weak, that's the time to start praising and worshiping. When you feel overwhelmed by life's turmoil, that's the time to start praising and worshiping. That's the time to start quoting scripture to yourself and saying, God, this is what you say about the situation. You are my refuge and my strength. You are a very person help in times of trouble. And so I'm going through some trouble right now, God, and I need you to show up. But you say you're already here. So open my eyes so I can see you. Open my ears so I can hear you.
but he knows us. And not only does he know us, but he acts in our lives. He holds us. Yes. The word says that Jesus holds all things together. So your life does not have to fall apart if you allow Jesus to hold it all together. In closing, when we be still and know that God is God, we are honoring God. Yes. When we're too busy, then we're not honoring God. We're not taking Him seriously. But when we stop long enough to hear from Him, and how long is long enough? As long as it takes. You can't say it's two minutes, it's five minutes, it's 15 minutes, it's an hour. Like people say, how long should we pray? You pray until you get the assurance in your spirit from the Holy Spirit that God has heard you and that he's acting on your behalf. So there are times when we may pray about a situation and we'll only pray for a couple of minutes. Because that, that, that's, you know, okay, surely God has, has heard. But there are some times when you've got to labor in prayer, you really have to be still and shut everything out and go to the throne room of God and labor in prayer until you feel the Holy Spirit say, okay, I got you. Amen. And when you feel that release, then you stop because you know that God has heard you and that he is responding. And so God says here, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That is an invitation to each and every one of us. Be still and know that I'm God. God is giving us an invitation. I hope and I pray that everyone in this sanctuary will RSVP for his invitation and will show up and be still and know that he is God. Yeah.